everybody. Welcome to the program. Today, a conversation with St. Francis head coach Todd Wolfson. You know, this year was, was the easiest year I've had in terms of implementing culture, in terms of getting everyone on board, in terms of, you know, parents and everything and administration and everyone was on board. I told people I didn't have a parent. I didn't have one parent meeting this year. I had 16 players, you know, um, and one, one, if not two, play the entire game. So um, you got to figure that out. I really, I really only subbed out three guys and uh, had no parent meetings, which is a phenomenal, phenomenal testament to our players and our parents. A conversation with Todd Wilson coming up. Todd Wilson is here. He is the current head basketball coach at St. Francis High School, a graduate of Cal State Northridge in communication. He also earned a master's degree in athletic administration at Concordia University in Irvine. In his first coaching stop in 2005 over at El Camino High School, he turned a program that was 0-23 into a winner in his final year at 18 and five. That led him to being named head coach at Chaminade High School in 2007. He was named LA Daily News and CIF Coach of the Year in 2009 for taking his team to the Division 4A Finals. He earned his second honor as Daily News Coach of the Year in 2014 when he became the youngest coach to lead a team to a state championship when they won in Division 3. He shocked many in the local basketball world when he stepped down as coach at the end of the 2015 season to become the new coach at St. Francis. Five years later, the Golden Knights won a state regional championship when his team, which hmm, was incorrectly ID'd as a JV team earlier this year, defeated Roosevelt High for the state regional title. That earned him his first title as Pasadena Star News Coach of the Year. He has coached players such as Jack Williams, Michael Ogwin, Jules Montgomery, Jamal McLeckern, Dennis Flowers III, Andre Henry, and others. We welcome Todd Wilson for this conversation. Thanks, man. Oh, appreciate welcome. it. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I appreciate yeah. it. First, yeah. first, congrats to you. I hear you're losing a bunch of weight. Trying. Awesome. Continue working. I know it's hard during the uh, stay-at-home period, but it looks like you're still plugging along. So keep doing that. Congratulations. I appreciate it, man. Thank you. Trying to look as good as you, man. <laughs> Man, I want to get that slim body there. So I need that, a little you know. more hair and I'll be all right. Yeah. Hey, um, let me ask you this question to start off with. How does working for three years at Tuscan Kitchen get you to become a championship basketball coach? <laughs> I always say, uh, you know, that job helped me a lot. You know, I, uh, I, was, I was in the kitchen. I was started as an expediter, worked in the back, and uh, learned how to, how to really – the back of the house works in a kitchen, and – learn how to communicate with uh, guys that spoke a different language than me and how to get along with them. And, um, and then I became a manager there. And, uh, you know, it, it's very similar, you know, running a restaurant and running a basketball program has a lot of similarities. You know, you're dealing with people, um, you know, and uh, you got to deal with customers, whether they're upset or happy and you're trying to please people and you're trying to build a team and cohesiveness. So it had a lot of similarities. It was, it was a great job and a great experience. And I, I, uh, I'm so happy. I, I got to take. Where did you play high school ball? So I played at El Camino High School um, in the Valley. Okay. You know, um, had a, had a, was very, very close to playing at Chaminade. And uh, last minute pulled out and uh, went to El Camino. Played what position? I'm sorry? What position did you play? Um, I wasn't very good. You know, I was just tall. So I played, uh, you know, kind of a four or five, you know, a little bit of three every once in a while. We had a big team. You know, we had uh, two, two, three guys that were bigger, taller than me. And, um, you know, coincidentally, we had a lot of guys that coached on that team, you know, from David Rubibo, who's at Harvard Westlake, to Ray Colston, who was our point guard, who's the girls coach at El Camino. Um, I think there's actually a couple more. Nick Kendall, who's a, a girls coach in the area. I want to say he's at Granada Hills High School. And I think there's, there's a couple more. We actually had a lot of coaches from that team. So, Did you all ever talk about wanting to coach? during that time period or were you just so naive you just were living the high school life so yeah so naive I started coaching my younger brother at like 13 14 that's when I knew I wanted to coach so I knew okay. at that time I wanted to coach and um that was my my cue for me um was 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 during that period but uh you know it's funny looking back like how many coaches we had during that time on the same basketball team is pretty interesting so you know I think our high school coach did a good job of maybe molding us into become coaches who was your coach his name was John Gould um, you know, and, 
came in there after um, my coach who coached me left and, uh, you know, did some good things. And, you know, um, everyone can say negatives and positives, but, you know, he, he turned out a bunch of good coaches. So um, good people. So I think he did his, he did a good job. You went to CSUN and got a, a degree in communication. What was yeah. the, uh, what was the thinking there? I uh, went to UC Santa Barbara first, uh, went there for three years, and uh, then got an opportunity to coach high school basketball at El Camino and uh, decided, you know what, it's time for me to transfer so I could pursue this. Uh, it was an opportunity I couldn't pass up. So I went to CSUN and got, was there a year and uh, got my communications degree. Communications has always been an interest for me, um, hence my Twitter and social media followings and things like that. I love communicating with people and being around people. So. That was a that was a choice for me. Why El Camino? Why, I know you played there, but I mean, when you arrived, the program it appeared it appears as if it was in pretty bad. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, it actually was a good opportunity for me. The AD um, there at the time called me and said, "Hey, I know you want to coach. I know something you're interested in doing, um, but you're in Santa Barbara. Our current coach, who was Alex Lopez, who's the older brother of Brooke and Robin Lopez, um, he was that was." At the time, at that time, they were being drafted um, to the NBA. So he was going to be gone a lot, and he was going to be doing things with them. So it was kind of like, hey, why don't you come help out and be a part of his staff and kind of be his a co-head coach kind of deal. And, you know, I thought him and I did a decent job of kind of reviving that program um, back from, from some bad times to some good times. And uh, he was an integral part of helping me with that. What did you learn right away? Uh, the game is about people. You know, X's and O's is important. And, you know, you got to have a, de a definitely a decent uh, basketball IQ when it comes to coaching. But in the end, like everything in life, it's about your relationships and it's about the people. And if you can get the people to believe in you, I think that was when you first learned that that, 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 that is what it takes to become a successful coach. Was it hard to take that first step? You know, as many times for many new coaches, taking mm -hmm. that first step is always the toughest step because you see the job that's in front of you. Yep. And you think, Oh my gosh, what am I getting into here? Yep. Was, was that something similar? No, I love that part of it. You know, I love hard work. I love rolling up my sleeves and getting myself dirty. You know, I've done that now with El Camino and I did that with Chaminade and, and then again with St. Francis. And there's something to be said about turning a program around and building culture um, from, the, from the ground up. You know, you can kind of make it your own in every facet. And um, that's what I tried to do at, at each program. And, and, and uh, you know, knock on wood, it's been, it's been successful. I don't know if there's an exact mold or, or rhyme or reason to it. Um, but it's, it's fun to, to, to build from the ground up. You really can see your, your imprint and, and uh, the things you've done to help, you know, the school and administration kind of get the program to where it needs to be. Your last year at El Camino, your 18 and 5, what were your memories from that team? Uh, that was a fun team. I'm still close with a lot of those guys now. And um, the cool part now is, like, those guys, you know, I went to a wedding of one of the players. Um, one of them just became a doctor. So he sent me, like, a nice little thing from his white coat, you know, a little ceremony he had. And, you know, just you, you, you get to the point where it's like, you know, they become – they're not players, they're people, you know. And I think that's a huge factor, and you learn. And then now I'm starting to get a little older and starting to have those players that are doing those things, and it's really, really cool. What was the – the composition of the team from a from just a maybe a, a mental point of view were they really close as a unit or was there some massaging you had to do to get it to where you were comfortable with you know with the way they were performing yeah you know um i think there was, there was a pretty good unit you know alex lopez did a great job with those guys um, building culture uh, he's a great man he's a great coach a great person and um you know, he, he, he kind of had those guys going in the right direction when, when things kind of started to change. So I got to give a lot of credit to what he did in terms of building that program and kind of turning that program around. How did you find out about the Shelmanot, Jeff? Um, through Brian Cantwell, actually. Um, we played them um, in a game. Uh, Shamanad played El Camino. And, uh, you know, I went to camp as a kid, uh, Shamanad camp when I was a kid, every year from probably eight years old to 13, 14 years old, I was, went to Chaminade camp in the summer for every week they had it, I was there and um, got to know their staff, got to know their coaches, got to know everybody at their, at, at, at their school at that point. And um, when we played them, he's like, I didn't know you were coaching. I didn't know you were interested in this. And, you know, why don't you, uh, why don't you be my JV coach for, for a little bit? And I'm going to probably step down in the next couple of years and, 
kind of stop coaching because I have a couple little kids and I don't want to miss baseball games. I don't want to miss, you know, things like that. So, you know, I'm not telling you I'm going to guarantee you're going to get the Chaminade job, but it would probably help if you were our coach for a year. And, and then as soon as I did it, he stepped down and just kind of worked out um, timing wise. And, um, you know, I applied for the job and, and, and was very fortunate that I had a, a group of administration and staff that would believe in a, in a young coach to help kind of shape the program. When you got the job, was this one of those moments where you sit back maybe for a moment and go, oh, my God, I'm in the Mission League now? Yeah, yeah, you know, <laughs> it was. It was. You know, a lot of, like, you know, am I ready for this, you know, questioning, what do I know, what do I know? And, um, you know, I'm, I'm 22. I'm going to be coaching kids that are 18, 19. You know, are they going to listen to me and um, things like that? And I remember sitting and talking to my dad and him telling me, you know, you, you got this job because you've been confident, continue to be confident. And, um, you know, it was, it was, it was crazy because we got thrown right into the fire. We went to the state, state champ, I'm sorry, the CIF championship that first year. You so, guys played Price, uh, correct? Yeah, well, I'm sorry? You guys played Price that, in the finals yeah, that year, right? Price in overtime, um, lost our best player, Jules Montgomery, the game before. And uh, tore his, he tore his ACL the game before. And uh, we ended up going to the finals and losing in overtime without him to a future NBA player in Alan Crabb. Yeah. That was a did really you, really What did you learn from that two week experience, you know, that two game experience where you lose your best player. Now you got to play in arguably yeah. probably the biggest game in, in your coaching career. Yeah. So it's early yeah. in your life. Yeah. Now you don't have your best guy. What yeah. You know, I think it's a lesson you learn right away is, which was helped me. I mean, especially even this year, you know, we can't sit here and cry about our problems, you know, same, similar to this year's team, not being able to play and, and go to the finals and, woe is me and let's feel bad for ourselves. You know, you can't hang your head, you know, every day you hang your head and it's is a lost day. And, um, you know, what, what, what can we do as a staff? And I remember my staff and us, we went right, as soon as we won that game against the finals, we went out and, and went right back to school and figured out what our game plan would be without Jules. Um, and I'll never forget that meeting. We are writing on napkins and whiteboards and papers and just trying to figure out how we could try to stop a future NBA player from, from beating us and, he ended up doing it, but we put up a fight without him. Is it hard when you're in that situation not to not – there's in such an – I believe – and I've, I've heard this before, that there's a negativity yeah. bias. that yeah. Our brains are so trained to be so negative. Yep. And when a situation like this happens, you just feel like, oh, my God, what are we yep. doing here? Yep, yep, yep. You know, there's all neg- not, not a lot of negativity. Look at the news today. You know, everything's negative. Yeah. Uh, you know, so I'm trying my best to stay as positive as possible with everything and – I think that's one of the good lessons you know, I learned early. You know, I almost say it's a, it's a blessing in disguise a little bit to that extent of learning, learning what to do during a situation like that. And, um, you know, it's prepared me as a coach. You know, all those past situations that, you know, you think are failures or think are, are bad things, they ended up being, you know, things where you can learn and benefit from. The thing I find so fascinating about the Mission League, when I arrived in 2010 uh, with John Mack when I was at Crespi, when, when I didn't yep. know basketball as much as the time as I do now, the coaching in the league is just remarkable. Yeah, it's just yeah. every week is a, it seems like every week is a championship game because the, yeah. the level of play is so high. The coaching is, you know, level is so high. It re, you really do have to be on, on your best game every night. Yep. Yep. And it makes it fun. You know, it makes it fun as a coach because it pushes you. You know, I've always said there's leagues out there where you can, you know, coast through a couple games and, um, have a couple nights off and rest some guys where in the mission league, that's not the case. I always say, if you're, if you're looking at the mission league and you're, and you're trying to find the easy game, that means you're the easy game. So, um, there's no easy ones and that makes it fun to coach. And these guys do a great job of pushing, pushing our staffs and myself to become better coaches each year. We got to be creative and find new ways to win because, you know, not only are we doing things to try to win, you know, they're, they're taking film from last year and seeing what we did and, trying to find ways to counter that. And then we're trying to find ways to counter that. And it's just a constant chess match. Give me a word to describe Jamal uh, McLeckern. Energetic. Jamal McLeckern was energetic. We were down three, no timeouts left. We were scraped our way back. We were down 10 early um, in the fourth quarter, scraped our way back. We had no timeouts left. Richard Solomon, who ended up playing for Cal, missed a free throw. Um, we were at Colony High School in the CIF championship game. Missed the free throw. We're down three. No timeouts. He's pushing the ball at full speed. I'm hoping he's going to stop and shoot a three, right? Because we're down three with eight seconds to go. Yeah. He blows right by the three-point line. 
I have my hands in my head like, you got to be kidding me. We're going to lose by one. He's going to make a layup. Of course, foul and one makes the free throw. We go to overtime. <clears throat> so um, I'll never forget that play as long as I live. That was one of those, no, 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 no. Oh, okay, okay. Great job. So. It took you five years to get to 2014. How special was the team? Unbelievable. Unbelievable team. Um, we had nine, nine kids on that team play college sports, which is, you know, out of 14, it's pretty unbelievable. Um, two actually became student managers on their team. So if you want to say 11 of the 14 were involved in sports in some way, just an unbelievable team, an unbelievable season. Uh, I don't think we really knew what we had until we started rolling um, during the season. And, uh, you know, just a lot of fun, you know, two or three fun memories from that, from that year that just stand out and I'll never forget. And the, and the people in that, on that team and the, and the parents and the families and the community that was built um, that year was phenomenal. Give me your best one. Um, I mean, winning state championship was fun. You know, that was a great game. Um, you know, the game before that, Michael Guinea hit a half court shot against Santa Margarita, <clears throat> which was probably the best shot of any shot I've ever been a part of. Um, never forget that as long as I live, I ran around, jumping around, trying to hug somebody and no one wanted to hug me. I felt like Jim Balvano. <laughs> that was a fun mon, uh, fun game. And then beating Loyola at Loyola, um, they were ranked one in the nation that year. And uh, <clears throat> I think we counted one year, Jamal and I, there were four, 13 or 14 Division I basketball players on the floor. I'm sorry, D Division I or two basketball players on the floor on that game um, at one time. So, I'm sorry, in, in the game to <clears throat> total at that time. So, pretty remarkable when you can look back and go, that was an unbelievable, just uh, from Parker Cartwright to Thomas Welsh to Henry Welsh to Trevor St <clears throat> Stanback to Jack Williams to Jaron Martin. I mean, just unbelievable talent on that on that teams and what a fun win we were up like 25 at one point at their place and Jim was packed sold out it was a really fun one trying to get all those <clears throat> different personalities characters to work as one it's got to be tough I mean yes and no you know there's times um yes and no I think you know you got to get the right people you know, I always go back to everything you do in life. You need the right people. Um, people are the most important thing. You got to get the right people. You know, we got rolling there at Chaminade, and then all of a sudden you hear, oh, hey, this kid wants to transfer in, this kid wants to transfer in, this kid wants to transfer in. I kept telling our administration, no, 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 no. You know, we don't want those guys. You know, we don't want those guys. You know, I'm going to find out about your character, and we want kids with high character, and we want people with high character. I'd rather have an eighth grader who comes and, and builds, you know, helps build the program the right way and, builds from the ground up and has high character and um you know those are the kids we really built that team around you know with Jack Williams who was there for four years and Max Tinsley who was there for four years and Jaron Martin who was there for four years and you know you know those are the guys that really kind of built that program it wasn't the guys that you know we didn't get six transfers that came in and really turned the program around. Is that tough you know sometimes to tell you know the administration you know, you look at the potential of a player and you go, man, I kind of wish I had him. But then you tell him, no, you know what? This, yep. th I've got my culture of my program. Yep. I got my guys. I don't need to be ruined by someone who wants to think about his <laughs> self-interest before right. the teams. Right, right. So, you know, I tell our guys all the time, that's what AAU's, a AAU's for. You know, go have fun and be yourself. And um, not only be yourself, but go play for yourself. You know, when we're here, we're playing as a team. And, uh, you know, it was fun. You, gotta, you know, I always say good, it's always better to get good, good people over good players. And um, we're going to continue to do that, you know, as long as I'm around any school. That's, that's the motto I want to keep. You told me this in private. I'm kind of, you know, I don't throw it all out there in public, so to speak. But um, what drew you to the St. Francis draft? Um, <clears throat> you know, well, same league. So we played there every year. Um, so I got to see the type of people that are at St. Francis. I got to see the type of hospitality that they, they bring. Um, I got to see the type of administration that they have. I got to see how their players would, you know, shake my hand and congratulate us and um, things like that after, um, after, you know, games were over. 
Um, I always say, I remember we won the state championship and I got an email from the principal at St. Francis, um, Tom Moran, who was our, you know, I don't say our enemy, but our, he's right. But he's in school in our league and Hey coach, congratulations on winning the state championship. Very cool way to represent our league. And that was it and simple, but something that always stuck with me, you know, and um, I've always said, those are the kind of people I want to be aligned with. You know, those are the kind of people I want to be a part of. And they, they fit on the same line as me in terms of what I want in a program and what I want to be a part of in a school. Because, you know, when you sign up to be a coach somewhere, you got to put your name on that school. You know, that school represents you and you represent that school. So they fit a lot of the same core values and a lot of the things that I've wanted to be a part of. And I felt it was the perfect fit for me. And the interview process was, I was told, was a slam dunk and you're hired. Now the problem is you got to go back and tell your team you're, you're leaving. Yep. Hardest meeting of your life? Uh, it was up there. It was up there. Um, you know, there were rumblings early, which I think it was bad, but it helped that kind of that blow. You know, it wasn't like a complete shock. You know, there were rumblings that were like, hey, I heard, heard Coach might go. You know, someone said he might go to UCLA. I'm like, I'm not going to UCLA. But, you know, things like that, you know, rumors that may have, <clears throat> may or may not have helped, you know, kind of ease the burden. And I kept telling my guys, don't worry, you know. Um, we had six seniors that year. So, you know, I didn't really leave a bunch of seniors behind. You know, there were some, which I always still feel bad for to this day. But, um, you know, we had a good chunk of guys that were leaving the same time I was leaving. So, um, but it was definitely tough. It was a tough meeting to have. Did you lean on somebody just to give, you know, just to ask maybe a couple of questions before you got the job? Like, okay, am I doing it? Am I, is this what I really want to do? You, you know, with, within the family, did you maybe have a conversation like, yeah, you know, like I'm thinking couple, about it. There's a couple of people I'm really close with, you know, that I really, really trust. Um, obviously my parents, you know, that was a big factor in kind of them. And, you know, they always go back to the age of, you know, are you going to be happy? And if it's yes, then, then do it. You know, that's their always their motto. And it's been their motto since I've been a kid. Uh, this is going to make you happy. Do it. And uh, they're, they're definitely one of them. Um, I talked to a couple people, you know, Matt Luter, the AD over there being one of them. And, you know, what do you think? And you came from a different school. You know, what, how do you feel about this place? And then um, probably my, <clears throat> my really good friend, Cornelius Holden, um, who was my assistant over there at Chaminade for eight years, um, you know, who I trust and who's a really, really good friend of mine. He's probably the other guy that I kind of lean on. What do you think? And he's like, man, this, this place fits you and your style. And, and then after talking to all those people, it kind of just was a, was a decision for me that I felt was the best one in terms of, you know, getting me in that point. And I've always loved that, you know, bringing that program from, you know, bringing a program that's at the bottom to the top. And uh, that was our goal. And I, I don't know why I have that. I love, I just love doing that. I love doing that. Um, I like getting my hands dirty and, and getting in there and doing that. How long did it take for, before you got to meet Jim Bonds? Huh. A couple days. <laughs> you know, you hear about this legendary football coach and, you know, um, even in my meetings, <clears throat> in my um, interview meetings, you know, administration, well, you know, our football coach, Jim Bonds, does a, does a great job and does it this way. And I'm taking notes on some of the things he was saying and doing. And, you know, he set such a precedent at St. Francis in terms of, how to do things right and how to treat people and, um, you know, how to, how to get, get the most out of the talent you have, you know, um, and uh, learned a lot from him. And I still continue, you know, I tell people I stand on the sideline. If you ever go to a St. Francis football game, I stand pretty close to coach Bonds just for the simple fact that I just want to learn from him, from him and all the stuff he knows and how he, how he does things. Cause he's, he does a really, really good job. You guys go back and forth a lot on ideas. Oh, yeah. Maybe. Oh, yeah. I, I probably talked to him twice, three times a week, even during this coronavirus. He's been picking my brains to find out what shows to watch. So I gave him a couple. Um, and he's liked all my recommendations. So I'm going to continue to hopefully be his, uh, his show guy. What was your first thoughts when you got the job, when you started getting your first month on the job? You take that yep. first step in. Here we go. And it's another, I don't want to say it's a month. I believe that that year they had made it to the finals, if I'm not mistaken. Two years before. Two years before. Two years before. Um, that first month of just evaluating everybody, every evaluate, had to be tough. It was tough. You know, we had one varsity player returning. Um, so that was hard. Um, Joey Walsh was our only guy that was returning. And, uh, you know, we just needed to change the culture, you know, uh, we wanted, we're tired of the way 
you know, the, we were walking in a gym and there'd be nobody there and we'd have no fans and no support. And um, the way the gym looked to the way the lobby looked to the uniforms to the, I, I wanted to change everything. Um, I felt in order to, to do this right, you know, the culture which I implemented and wanted to, wanted to get to in the vision, which, you know, I felt could, could take place at a school, a great school like St. Francis, you know, a lot, a lot of work had to be done. And unfortunately that first year, you know, it was kind of a sacrificial, you know, we got in late, um, we got in there in, in uh, late summer. So we really didn't have a summer to kind of build. And I'll always remember that group because that was a tough transition for them, you know, completely different playing style, completely different mentality, completely different culture. And, uh, you know, those guys did a great job. We had a lot, a lot of fun that year. Um, we only won, I want to say seven games, uh, but we had a lot of, a lot of fun. And I always remember a lot of those guys and they still come back and, you know, I was telling them they were a big part of how this program has become. What was so fun about it? Um, just to, you know, there was, I went from a high pressure, win every game at all costs, you know, compete for a state championship every single day and mentality to not, you know, and it made it fun. You know, it brought basketball fun and it kind of re reinvigorated me and got my juices flowing again. And, um, you know, I, I, I like having that big ball of clay that we can mold. Um, to me, that's fun. And, uh, you know, the first thing I did was hire the right guys. And, you know, I, they've been there ever since. I haven't had anybody change. Uh, you know, I've had the same four, pretty much the same four assistant coaches since day one um, for the last five years. And I called all of them this week, and they're all coming back for year six. And, you know, that's the most important thing for me. The only guys left was Devin Fly, who got a job at Webb. Um, you know, became a head coach, which I obviously try to encourage all my guys to do. And um, he's the only turnover I've had. And it's, it's been a testament to those guys. Is they, they, they've been fantastic in helping this program. It's almost, you don't want to penalize that first year, but it's, just, it's like you, that wasn't really your true, your first year. Your, your second year kind of was like your first year because now everything is in. You're all in. Right. You're starting from an equal starting point, everybody right. else. Right. Um, what was the one thing that you had to change right away that you isolated from year one to year two that, okay, I got I to gotta change this right away for us to get to that, what I call the 80% curve. Right. And 10, 80, right. 10. So let's, right. you know, so what, what, what was the one thing you had to, you had to change in your mind? I mean, I think it's, you know, it's, as cliche as it sounds, it's the culture, you know, it has to change. Um, and I feel like we, we did a good job of trying to implement our culture there. Um, you know, and it starts before we even show up. You know, our culture it needs to be built before we even get there. I think, you know, you can lead by reputation before you even show up at a place. And, you know, we try to do that before we even got there and, you know, try to try to really turn that program. And those guys knew what they were getting themselves into. We had a couple kids that transferred before I even showed up. They heard I got the job and they left. Um, we had a couple kids that decided not to play before I even could talk to them because um, I felt that they, they knew what they were even possibly getting themselves into culture change wise and they didn't want to be a part of it. And, um, that's fine. You know, it is what it is. And, um, you know, uh, hopefully they, they regret the decision now because they could see what the program's become, but, um, you know, it's hard. I get change is hard for everybody, but I think just implementing that culture from day one was the, was the most important thing for us. Without going too much into detail, what, it, what is the culture of, of what that you want to see within your program or within uh, the players? Team first. That's our culture. You know, everything that we do needs to be for the team. Every decision you make needs to be for the team. Um, everything in the community needs to be for the team. Um, everything that we do as a school, it needs to be about our boys and, and, and helping them. And, you know, I tell our guys all the time, every, you know, you'll have a decision, a hundred decisions each day, which you're going to question, do I, am I putting the team first? And if the answer is no, then you're not a team first guy and you're not part of what our culture is about. And uh, it says it on our wall, it's ingrained in our floor. Um, you know, it's, it's what I want. It's what I want to make sure we do. Um, you know, everybody, you know, it's Friday night and it's eight o'clock and you're going to go to a party, but we have a game tomorrow and it's just a summer game, but it's a, it's a game. Do I go? Well, am I putting the team first? The answer is no. So, you know, um, that decision needs to be made. So that's kind of what the implementation we wanted for that team first motto. Is it hard? Oh yeah, it's hard. It's hard. Yeah, it's hard. But you know, like I said, it goes back to the right people. When you surround yourself with the right people and the right players, 
um, it, it, it was definitely easy this year. You know, this year was, was the easiest year I've had in terms of implementing culture, in terms of getting everyone on board, in terms of, you know, parents and everything and administration and everyone was on board. I told people I didn't have a parent, I didn't have one parent meeting this year. I had 16 players, you know, um, and one, one, if not two, play the entire game. So um, you got to figure that out. I really, I really only subbed out three guys and uh, had no parent meetings, which is a phenomenal, phenomenal testament to our players and our parents. It's about mastering your role. I've always oh. said if you can master your role. Yep. You know, you know, uh, and I'm reminded of a lot of what Bill Belichick says, huh? you know, he, or how he delegates things, which is I'm going to give you a job, give you all your responsibility, you go have at it. Correct. Correct. And that's what we do. You know, we're pretty, pretty upfront about our, to our guys and, you know, Hey, here's where the role we see you. You know, our role is we need you to push Andre in practice every day. You know, you might not play five minutes the whole season, but if you want to push him and you want to be a part of something special and you want to be part of a team and, you know, some fun and, and all that stuff, then, then we'd love to have you. And we had a, we had a good group of guys that wanted to do that and understand their roles. And um, it showed, it showed. The second year, you're starting to pick up some traction now, winning some more games. Uh -huh. Did you feel that, that what you, the vision for your program is beginning to kind of take mold, so to speak? Yep, yep. You know, you started to get a little traction. You started to get, you know, a little noise in the, in the area. I know we played Lock and Yala that, that second year and got really, really close to beating them. Um, got close to Loyola beating them. And I was like, all right, we can kind of finally turn this program the right way. And that kind of we started to get our first, uh, first part of that little traction. It felt, felt like we were actually, you know, making, making an indent in, uh, in the community as well. And, 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 you know, getting to attract, you know, to talk to the youth in the area and learning people. And, you know, I always say I'm, I'm at lunch in La Cunata every, every single day, different restaurants, meeting new people, trying to meet new community members, trying to invite people to our games and getting to know, you know, that area as best as I can, because in the end, everything's going to be in relationships. Then your third year, more, more success. Yep. Then came the, uh, you know, then came, you know, the mission league again was tough. Yep. There was a chance. Yep. You might not make the playoffs. Yep. Uh, heady times. Yeah. It's tough. It was tough. That was a tough year. Um, just cause of the way the playoffs were set up. And uh, the mission league was really, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable every year, but that year was, I think that year was one of the best years it was, it, it's been. Um, and, uh, you know, it was a tough year for us. We, we ended up squeaking our, squeaking our way in and, um, you know, crazy. Always remember that year and, and that, and that group, cause they had a lot of tenacity and they, they really, really wanted to, to make the playoffs and, and really wanted to try to, to, uh, continue to progress the, the program in the right direction. Give me a sentence to describe Dennis Flowers. Fun, fun. Um, one of the most fun kids I've coached, you know. Um, <clears throat> I remember, I forgot what game it was. It was a summer game somewhere, a tie game. I think it was, it was a Fairfax tournament. And uh, tie game and heat of the moment. And we draw something up. I'm like, Dennis, you good? He goes, coach, I got you, man. You know, um, just a fun, fun guy to coach, you know, um, and, and it's really, you know, play with a chip on his shoulder everywhere he went and um, is really showing how good he is in college, you know, winning freshman player of the year um, in his conference, you know, testament to how much work he's put in, how much better he's gotten. From year one to the end of last season, before we start 19 and 20. Yep. That, that road – the longest, it, it appears, but probably the most rewarding. Would I be off with, you know, because you're seeing it develop right in front of your eyes. Yep. Am I, am, yep. I, am, I, am I on the right track here? Yep. Yep. Very rewarding. Very, very rewarding. You know, you get to see the full, full body of what we were envisioning. You know, that's why I would say it's one thing to have a vision of a program. Um, it's another thing to actually, it actually works. <laughs> so, um, you know, um, we have a different year, you know, Andre and Jason get hurt and we go, oh, and whatever in the league and we win 10 games and who knows where we're at, who knows in terms of culture and, you know, um, belief and community and all that stuff we're at. But I think that, you know, you got to believe that good things happen to good people. 
And, you know, our, our team has a lot of good people and our community has a lot of good people. And I think a lot of good things happened to us this year, you know, though it ended in a sour, sourish way. Um, I have no regrets on anything that happened this year. One, I, I'm surprised because you have so many players that you, you know, you, you've coached are so well, so talented that, you, you know, including your leader this year, we'll talk about him in a moment, but I, I, I find it striking when I popped up the video of you, there's a picture of Fred Harper in the back and there's a, me, and there's a kind of a message behind that. So you told yeah. me earlier, uh, I'd rather let you tell me the, the story. Yeah. So I got it in my office. I got a little picture behind me of Fred Harper dribbling a ball. <clears throat> and uh, I won't get too emotional. I talk about that picture, but Fred, Fred was probably the guy on our team for the past couple of years. That's an unsung hero. Um, he's our hard, hard hat, lunch pail guy. People, if you coached against us, you probably hated Fred. Um, he guarded the other team's best player. He did the dirty work for us. He was the perfect guy that we envisioned at St. Francis, the hard worker, the, the, kid that always played with a chip on his shoulder. Um, and the reason why I have that picture is because he got a steal. It's our third round playoff game. The gym is full, our student section is packed. You can see a little bit of like the, even the hallway and the lobby where it leads to the bathroom. There's tons of people. And I feel like that picture sums up the culmination of like what we envisioned before we got there. A sold out gym, uh, packed student section, players that are, the right kind of kids and the hard workers and um, you know, it's a third round playoff game at home. Never would have envisioned we would get there so quick with that, with that. And that's why that picture means a lot to me. Is that part, and I would assume it's because you see a lot of yourself in that picture with Fred. Uh, yeah. You know, he just, you know, Fred's just an unsung hero, you know, um, you had a lot of guys, whether it was Andre and Omari Moores and guys that, you know, were program guys that did a lot of good things and <clears throat> Joey Walsh's and Lucas Shins. And then you have Fred, who's kind of always that second tier in terms of points per game and things like that. But he's a testament to hard work. You start practice 2019 for this upcoming season. Yep. What was the message to the team? Um, just continue, continue our culture, continue. And I thought we had some really, really special before the year started. You know, I felt we had all the pieces we needed. Um, just have, have fun, and, and then we set a goal to win a state championship. And, uh, you know, we got close. <laughs> we got close. How big was the Damien tournament? Uh, it was good. It was good. It prepared us a lot. You know, not only did it prepare us, I feel like it gave us a lot of confidence. Um, you know, years past, we didn't play in the Damien tournament. We played in a little bit of a lesser level tournament and, uh, you know, we jumped right into the league. I don't know if we were fully prepared for what we were getting ourselves into for league. Um, we played a team from Hawaii <clears throat> and Mary Noel, that was probably the top five team we played all year and probably one of the most well coached teams we played all year. Um, and, uh, squeezed one out at the end and found a way to win. And I think that just gave us a shot of confidence that uh, really, really, really helped us this year. And, um, you know, definitely want to go back to Damien next year to try to continue to do the same thing. Every team has what I call the, I don't want to say the fork in the road. Right. There's a defining moment to the season. Right. And I remember, because I was there that night, or that whole week, you guys had played Harvard-Westlake. Yep. Barely lost to them. Yep. And I could see your players afterward. They were just... I don't want to say their heads are spinning, but uh, it was a defining moment for the team, wasn't it? Yep, yep, yep. You know, that Harvard game, we thought we were going to win um, going into it. Um, we thought we, were, we had a good game plan, and we, thought, we felt like we, <clears throat> we had the right tools in place, and we thought we were rolling at the right time, and um, we're at home. And, you know, I felt they were the testament of the top team in the league, and we're close to, to getting to that point. We felt we could hang. So um, losing by a couple that night, you know, it was, it came down on the wire at the end and, you know, didn't go our way. And um, there were some pissed off people in the gym. I mean, sorry, pissed off people in the locker room after that game was over um, in terms of like, like we're, we're, we're done losing. You know, we're done with this. I'm done losing. We're done losing. Not coaches, players. Um, and they, 
I remember that was one of those games where we kind of came to the locker room. They were already talking. It wasn't a coach's speech after that one. They were already talking and they were already like, hey, we're, I'm, I'm done with this losing in league stuff. And then we came around and played Alamany in Notre Dame and <laughs> had an unbelievable week where we, you know, uh, it's a week I'll never forget as a coach. I wouldn't surprise you. I think you beat Alamany by 40. It was it was a it was an unbelievable two game performance. So um, I was very impressed with our guys after that one. As a coach, you just sit back and just let this happen because now it's on them. Uh, no, you know I think it's on us as well as them. You know I tell our guys it's it's it goes both ways. You know we got to continue to hold them accountable. You know um, I remember you know second round of playoffs we played Heritage Christian and you know Andre Henry missed the box out and. I subbed him out, you know. I remember that moment very, very well. I, 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 and we'll get to that game in a moment. Yeah. But I know, do remember it, it just I do rem- I'm holding you accountable. I don't care when – I don't care to see I have championship. I'm holding you accountable. Um, we expect certain things out of certain guys. You know, you have a role in this team and you have, a, you have something that you need, to, you need to do and accomplish for the team. We need you to do it. Um, I don't care if it's a championship game. I'm going to hold you accountable. I don't care if you're our best player. Um, you know, I think that, that, that helps define our culture. I just remember from that game and that moment, I know exactly where that moment was because you took him out and I remember your first two words, or your first uh, question to him was, what is wrong with you? Yeah. And I, I, I just, it just struck me because a lot of players without the right mindset, they'll shut it down because you've yep. now, there's, there's that moment of, I call the minor deportation where a player can either go up or he can go down. Yep. It can go either way, yep. and we're going to find out how well of a player from a from a player performance point of view you're going to be. He took it and, and ran off with it. Yeah, I mean, each kid you got to coach differently. I would, there's probably three kids on my team I could say that to. Um, I'd say the other 13 I couldn't. You know, each kid you got to kind of massage different ways. Andre is one of those where you got to kind of get in them a little bit to get them a little fire. Um, you kind of got to get on them a little bit to get them a little fire. You know, other guys, you kind of got to put your arm around them and massage their egos a little bit and make sure they're feeling happy. Um, but Andre is one of those kids where you got you to gotta light a fire up under him every once in a while. The thing I'll remember about the Heritage Christian game, too, was I know you were sick, you were ill, um, but the poise that you showed on the bench that night was remarkable. In a high moment of tension, you just, you, I mean, I know you were sick and you didn't want to lose, you lose too much energy. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, how hard was it just to, to stay within that moment? Yeah. You know, where we, you know, I don't need to go back and revision this history and, and talk about what happened before the game and everything, but to stay in that moment, it got to be hard. Yeah. I was felt awful that night. Um, awful. Um, oh. But, you know, I give credit to my assistants. You know, they showed up early. They did, they did our, you know, we had a game plan and they implemented it and did a walkthrough. And, and you know, we talked about how we're going to guard Sky Clark and, you know, all the stuff that we had to do for that, for that night. And I, I give them full credit for that, for that W, um, you know, that night, which was, which was very, 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 very rewarding for us on a lot of levels. Where does that win rank in your all-time list? Uh, I don't think very, I mean, I don't know if very high, you know, um, only, only part of it just cause you know, part of it was fun. So Jackson Mosley got his, his big time moments to shine and you know, he needed that. We needed that from him. Um, and that's the reason why I think I like that win a lot, but you know, there was definitely some more that were bigger than that one. Um, but it's up there. Yeah, it was, it was good. It was good. I mean, I think we had a, you know, my staff did a great job. They really did in terms of, implementing that game plan and and our players play with no fear so um they weren't scared of him and you know um and all the stuff that he did so you hit the road you go to roosevelt the the one thing i took away watching that game early on never seen you guys come out as fast as you did yep 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 yeah we came out pretty fired up you know given you know they 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 played a that was a tough game for them um, and you saw when they rebounded against us the next time how much better they played. But they, you know, they played two games, two nights before they played at Alamany, long bus ride, overtime game, emotional game. They won on the buzzer, won at the buzzer. 
I knew they were not going to come out very fast just because that's just, that's just life. Um, you know, and, uh, thank God we hit them early and kind of knocked them out a little early. Um, but that was a tough one for them in terms of getting fired up for just cause you know, anytime you play on the road, you got to drive a long way and then you went on a buzzer and emotions are high and then you get there the next day and it's let down and <clears throat> that's usually the way sports work. So, um, we knew that we, we knew it was coming a little bit, not, not, not that much, but you know, we ran a play for Jason first play of the game, kind of Andre as a decoy and, um, knocked down a shot and we just kind of was, 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 uh, the rest was history. And I was like, I'm watching the game actually covering it didn't mm-hmm. think you know was thinking they had the 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 live feed and i just remembered like 16 2 16 4 something like that i'm like whoa you give a team we were, locked, we were locked in defensively and yeah <clears throat> they scored four points in the third quarter which was unbelievable you know our defense was phenomenal that night so i got to give our guys credit how hard is it to rebound from losing a championship game to get into that first game back in the state regional. I mean, I, I mean, the 24 hours had to be tough. I mean, it was, and it wasn't, you know, I thought I did a bad job in terms of game plan for that championship game. Um, I didn't have our guys ready as I thought I could. Um, but I remember going to the locker room and Andre Henry was standing up telling guys, not cry. We're not crying. The season's not over. I don't want to see tears. Let's go get your stuff. And, and we're, we're moving on. We're learning. What can we learn? And, that was his message to our team. And, you know, Jason Gow was piggybacking that message to our guys. And, you know, there were no tears. There was no, you know, maybe a little upset, you know, by the way we played and the way we shot. And, you know, our coaches were upset with our game plan. But, you know, got me a credit to Sanford and Christian. They were phenomenal that, that, that day. Without going too much into too much detail, so to speak, Todd, what made them so tough to defend? He could shoot. He could post you up. He can go right. He can go left. Um, his first step was phenomenal. Um, he, when he rebounded it, you were in trouble because you weren't going to stop him down the floor. And I'd say his best quality is he was unselfish. So if you loaded up the key with guys to try to, you know, have, whenever he caught, a lot of teams, what they would try to do is put two or three guys in the paint when he caught the ball. He had no problem throwing it to the to our shooters. And when you have a, your best player who doesn't care if he scores points, it just makes it more difficult to guard because then we start knocking down threes, and then you got to bring those guys back out, and then it opens up the lane for him, and it's just a, a chess game from start to finish. Fast forward to your last game against Roosevelt. It's mm-hmm. at home. It's at your place. Yep. What's the message to the team beforehand? Because it's, you know, there's the old saying, it's tough to beat the same team twice. Yeah. You know, you know, and you guys haven't played a team more than once all year, I don't think, you know, because of the mission league, you only get one ro- rotation, then you play, you know, in, in your tournament. Um, how was the mindset of the team going into the, into the last game of the year? Which would it be? You know, I think that's when we got to the point where it was almost like we're done coaching. Here's what we got. Here's our game plan. You guys know what to do. You know, um, when you have five seniors, six seniors that are, leading the team um, in a lot of ways. We're not reinventing the wheel. Our, our defenses were ready to go and sit that, and we weren't making any crazy changes and game plan changes. We told them if they want to win, you'll win. If you're ready to go, here's, here's, here's what we do. You know, here's St. Francis basketball. Here's what we do. Here's how we play. You guys want to win, we'll win. Um, or we showed them a clip, you know, just clips of the good things they did against us and the, the changes, the adjustments they made in the following game. Um, since they've played us and uh, you know like once again our seniors led us late and uh, did a good job game's over you're on the on the on the uh, on the ladder yep what a moment yeah I was trying not to cry that's what is I was it because of the road you took yeah it just was it was like one of those you know it worked moments you know, um, you know, here was the recipe and we put it in the oven and five years later we took it out of the oven and it was, it was, it was, it worked. And, uh, I was sitting up there and all I was thinking about was cutting that nose. Please don't cry. Please don't cry. Please don't cry. <laughs> no so, one would have thought of you different now if you had. No, no, I know, but I gotta have that tough persona, you know, I gotta have that tough persona. So 
You don't have to have it all the time now. Yeah, no, I was just trying not to cry. I ended up crying when we got in the locker room. Um, but, you know, um, it, was a, it was a fun moment. It was one of those, like, wow, you know. Is it, because of, a, is it because of time investment? You invested uh -huh. so much time to getting to that point. Now, when you get there, it's almost like you, you reach the, type, you know, the apex of the mountain and you go, man, that's a pretty good view here. It was just everything we wanted, you know. Um, I remember, what, you know, when I got in there, when I first got the job at St. Francis and I was talking to Matt Luter and I said, you know, let's talk about what you want. And I said, I want to build a student section, which we had at that game. Game was sold out. I said, I want to sell out games. We sold out every game of the state championships. Um, I said, I wanted the gym to be redone. New lights, new logos, new, new color schemes new everything, new scoreboards. I want to turn the lights out, starting lineups. I want, you know, that was all done. I wanted a new lobby area, you know, new trophy cases, new record books, all that stuff was done. I wanted new uniforms. We were playing in new uniforms and, and I want the right kind of players. And you're up there on the ladder and you look down and you got the right kind of players and the right kind of families and the right kind of people, which just was the culmination of everything we wanted. Jason Gallant to me is the epitome of a Todd Wilson coach player. Yeah, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Yeah. What was, when you first saw him play, when he first came to your program, mm -hmm. what was your initial thoughts on him? Uh, he could be really, really good. He could be really, really good. And uh, I saw the potential, and uh, we saw the potential in him <clears throat> and what he could be if he, if he got it all together. We knew he had it in him. Um, there were some tough times, you know, where him and I butted heads and, you know, he didn't understand why, why we did things and, you know, how we could motivate him certain ways and push his buttons certain ways. And, and then all of a sudden that second week of the season, and he just completely turned a corner, completely turned a corner. I don't think he made a three the first four games of the year. He was like 0 for 20, um, frustrated. And then he mentally turned it around. I got to give him all the credit in the world. And, you know, he'll always be remembered as a, you know, in the, in the record books of St. Francis High School for what he did. The game against Locking Yon, and I don't, I want to just go back to it real fast because there's a picture, and I know you've seen it. I believe it was in the second game, in the playoff game, where it's halftime, you, you got your arm around Andre, heading to the locker room. Do you remember what the conversation was? Yeah. I asked him what he ate for breakfast. <laughs> and his answer was what? He answered, I forgot what he said, cereal oh. or something. And he smiled. And I said, I told just relax. You know, you know, he, he went to Lock and Yada Middle School. Oh, yeah. So those were all his friends. The student section was all his friends. They were chanting Trader and, you know, stuff like that. Because he was supposed to go to Lock and Yada High School. That was one of his options. And uh, it was a lot of emotion for him, you know, because he felt sometimes like if he doesn't play well, it's we lose, it's on him. Um, so I just wanted him to get his mind somewhere else and, you know, I asked him what he had for breakfast. And then I said, you know, I forgot, you know, uh, how was school today? You know, I just tried to get his mind off somewhere else. And I think I got a couple smiles out of him and he played a great second half and, uh, you know, was the key, key part into winning that game for us. When did you first know there was a problem that you may not go to Sacramento? Uh, I didn't believe it, or I didn't know if I didn't, I didn't want to believe it um, until the NBA got canceled. And that's when I realized we're in trouble. Uh, you know, I thought to myself, how can we play a game in an arena that the night before an NBA game was canceled in the same arena? That just doesn't make any sense. So, you know, um, I'm packing Tuesday night <clears throat> and the NBA gets canceled. And part of me was like, I know this ain't going to happen. But, you know, as a coach, you still got to pack. You still got to plan and until you get word that it's, you know, done. You got to continue to keep going. So we kept going until we finally got that call um, on Wednesday and found out we weren't going to play. What was your first thought? Selfish. Why us? You know, why me? Why this team? We worked so hard. You know, we watched a ton of film. We felt we had the right game plan. We felt we were going to beat those guys. Um, you know, they were good. But 
we were ready. I felt we were ready. You know, we were peaking at the right time. We were doing all the right things and, you know, got a little selfish and why us? And, you know, it, uh, it was a tough thing. You know, when you're, when you're, when you're older, you know, as coaches, we realized as we were going to go talk to them, you know, this is a serious matter. This is a pandemic. This is a life threatening thing. But when you're 14, 15, 16, your whole life is high school sports and basketball and things like that. So um, it was a big deal for them. A lot of tears, a lot of crying, a lot of emotions. And then they switched their gear to how can we help? How can we fix this problem? How can we help people? And said some prayer and did some things. And, you know, the emotion went from us being selfish to us understanding that there's more to life than, than basketball at certain times. You kind of, did you go home kind of looking up in the ceiling saying, man, what could have been? Yeah, there's been times, you know, what could have been, but, you know, there's also the other side of it, you know, looking back like most wins in school history and probably the best team in school history. And, you know, we had leading score in school history and, you know, you look at all the positives, you know, it's easy to, to look at negatives and what, what could have been. <clears throat> I'm a big believer. And let's just look at the positive side of it. What, what, what did we do and how much fun do we have? And I'll always remember this team and, and uh, the fun times we have. I, don't, I just hope we get to have a banquet. I'm just dying to have a banquet and, you know, I'm hoping soon I can have one and see my guys again and see their families again and their parents. So we can all celebrate the, uh, the fun year we had together and you can listen to some guys speeches and things, but you know, um, that'll be my championship. If we can just have a banquet sometime. Wow. Um, you even caught me here for a second. Um, <laughs> Jeez, I, it's just I can't imagine walking out of that team meeting, telling your players your season's over, and not just having a moment just to let it go. Yeah, I mean, I was I was in tears. I was crying. Um, it was hard, you know. You know, especially when you're not predicted to be a champion. You know, I think it would have been different if we were the number one team overall, and we were in the open division, and everyone picked us to win, and from this, from, from, from June 1st, we were predicted to be a state championship. I mean, there's no one in the world that predicted us to get to where we, where we got to. So it was tough because we didn't get an opportunity to kind of put a, put a bow on the, the end of the present, but you know, the present was still pretty big for us. If someone handed you a picture of you clipping down the net over in the wind over Roosevelt. Yep. Is that something you can live? You can live with with the rest of your life. Oh yeah, it's going right next to my other picture. It's going right next to that picture. Um, I already got it. Got it printed. <clears throat> printed. I just need to get a frame for it, and it's going to go right, right next to that one where um, I can always remember that moment. You know, being on that ladder and looking down and seeing everything that we've we've accomplished and everything our players have have done for our school and and uh, you know cherish that moment. Do the players understand what, what this whole situation is about right now? Just, I mean, uh, how big th this will be talked about 20, 40 years from now? The pandemic? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, we talk, you know, we meet all the time. Um, so we talk about things and we talk about video games and pandemics and, you know, we try to keep <clears throat> our conversation with them as positive and as enlightening as possible. You know, you go on the news, you go on Twitter and all you see is negative. So we try to stay away from as much as we can, but yeah, we talk about it and they're, they're not, you know, they're, they're, they're understanding how, how crazy this time is. Is it tough because you don't have answers as a coach? You're all, you're so used to having an answer. Now you don't have yeah. an answer. That's a good point. Yeah. Never thought of it that way, but I think that's a very, very good point. You know, we don't really have, no one knows. You know, no one knows and, you know, um, you know, pray to God that doesn't affect anyone we know or as many people as it, as it doesn't affect as many people as hopefully people are saying it's going to. Um, so we're really trying to pray for everybody and, you know, and, and, and just keep everybody in a positive mindset until this thing goes away. I have one more question for you. Sure. The state of basketball, high school basketball today, are you, is it where you think it should be? Uh, I think there's a lot of positives to it. I think there's also a lot of negatives. Um, there's a lot of dirty stuff going on. There's a lot of a uh, lot of me. What about me? You know, um, a lot of mixtapes of guys getting crossed over and falling down, and people think that's cool. And guys getting scared to be dunked on because they might be on YouTube. And you know, a lot of guys standing on the baseline filming 
filming guys trying to make money off high school kids and there's a lot of bad, you know, but I think there's way, 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 way more good than bad. Um, I think with anything, there's going to be bad, um, but you know, there's way more good. And, you know, it's fun to see that a team that, you know, doesn't really have the hype and the, the uh, big names as most can actually win a, win a bunch of games and compete for a state championship. And <clears throat> it shows me that there's, there's hope for those teams that, you know, don't have, that headline big time guy or seven footers or, you know, six transfers and things like that. I think there's, there's hope for those teams. Todd Wilson, St. Francis high school. Thank you for your time. Thanks for having me, man. I hope everybody's staying at home and staying safe and doing those things. And, uh, you know, it's a tough time for everybody, but we got to try to stay positive and just and, and enjoy our families and just do as much as we can at home. So. Passing in Star News, Coach of the Year. I appreciate Thanks. you. I, I appreciate you your time. Thank you, guys. Hope to be back there soon. We're all hoping. Be well, nice. my friend. Cool. That's all the time we have for today. Until we speak next time, I'm James Escarcega. Thank you, and stay safe.